The big story rocking the railway preservation world in the UK this month is not the granting of planning permission for the Lenton and Barnstable Railway to extend their running line a further four and a half miles south towards Blackmoor Gate. It's the opposition to the granting of planning permission for the Linton and Barnstable Railway to extend their running line a further four and a half miles south towards Blackmore Gate. At least according to the mainstream press and social media it was. On March the 6th, 2018, the Exmoor National Park Authority met at Linton Town Hall to discuss the next imminent phase of the reopening of the old two-foot gauge line opened in 1898 and closed by the Southern Railway in 1935. Four out of the five planning applications were approved at the meeting, the only rejection being the demolition and replacement of a bungalow at one of the halts. Railway enthusiasts had every right to rejoice, as the L&B is one of those lost idyllic treasures of railway history whose renovations simply can't come soon enough. However, the celebrations were overshadowed somewhat by the subsequent highlighting of the opposition and the subsequent response to it most notably to that of local resident Louise Grob, whose land occupies part of the old track bed, and her daughter Ella Hunt, both expressing their displeasure on BBC News. Now before anybody starts mouthing off about how Mrs Grob and Miss Hunt are moronic, naive idiots who need a damn good seeing to, seriously real mature guys, let's remain civil about this. Prejudice, name-calling and sexual harassment via social media won't help railway preservation as a whole, let alone the LNB's cause. Besides, the railway grapevine already pipped those thoughts to the post. Louise and Ella are perfectly entitled to have their say and to stand by it, as is the way with democracy. No amount of victimising is going to change their views. But what might help everybody to understand the heart of the matter is to go over the opposing statements and see what factual evidence there is both for and against these statements. We need clean air. We need areas of peace and tranquility and dark skies. This is understandable. After all, it's much cleaner to have no railway at all than to have a railway. Providing the alternative to a railway isn't more harmful. But the railway is being reinstated on a route that was laid over 120 years ago. One of Mrs Grob's statements was, if you want to play trains, do it elsewhere. But surely it would be more destructive to lay it on virgin land. And as for clean air, we'll come back to that. I think it's, essentially it's the Disneyfication of Exmoor National Park. This statement doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Is she implying the fear of Exmoor becoming a heavily commercial area if the railway brings in more people, more money and more jobs? Does she think the railway is going to buy out any profitable entity they consider to be a threat to their business? Or does she think everybody in Linton and Linmouth is going to become an orphan princess who can expect to be cheered up by true love's first kiss if they're having a bad day? Yeah, I know, I'm making superlicious jokes about these concerns, but there was no evidence being made to back this statement up. Either way, it's kind of ironic seeing as Walt Disney was a railway enthusiast himself. It's toy trains. It's choo-choo trains. Okay, now we're just throwing random insults. Small it may be, but this toy choo-choo still weighs more than 20 tonnes. It might not be the same size as your daily commute, but if you happen to get in the way, it'll still put you in A&E. If you're very lucky. Important lesson to learn here. Anything with varying ability of killing someone, intentional or otherwise, is not a toy. The sort of jobs it will bring in is tea rooms. As much as I can understand and empathise with Miss Hunt's concerns, I think these are a little bit misleading. After all, people who visit Heritage Railways do tend to spend their money in other businesses located within the area, such as local gift shops, chippies, breweries, pubs, restaurants, ice cream kiosks, with the potential of staying in local hotels, guest houses and B&Bs. Also, part of the LNB's grand plan is to build a new engineering facility at Blackmoor Gate to maintain its rolling stock. I can't speak on behalf of the LNB if they intend to use this for commercial or non-commercial purposes, but there may come a point when the business becomes so big and the railway becomes so busy that they may have no choice but to employ a handful of operational and management staff. As someone who spent seven years in the manufacturing industry, I can tell you that it's a bit different than tea rooms. What we need to be encouraging people to do is to explore the park in a natural, real way. Now, this is the point that's worth taking the most seriously. We all have to do our bit for the environment, seeing as we're escalating through a downward spiral towards the point of no return, but no matter what we try to encourage, it's highly unlikely that everybody who visits Exmoor will want to cross it on horseback and foot like they did before the 19th century. Considering there's an A road linking Barnstable with Linton and Linmouth, chances are the vast majority of people already drive across Exmoor, which is likely to cause even more destruction in the long run. You can sit by the side of a country road for half an hour and watch 50 to 100 cars going by carrying anything from 50 to 700 people. Or you can have one train going by carrying anything from one to several hundred people. 
It's easy to understand concerns as we're talking about coal-burning locomotives, but pollution levels really became uncontrollable when personal car ownership became available to the masses, particularly as 39.1% of registered cars on the UK's roads in 2016 were diesels, which the government are now considering more harmful than petrol cars due to the nitrogen-based gases they emit alongside the CO2 levels. The ozone layer was initially designated punctured in 1985, long after BR stopped running steam engines, yet we didn't start doing much about that until after the last steam engine left Barry Scrapyard in 1994. Climate change is a thing, but I ask you, what method of carrying 100 people is likely to be the most harmful to the environment? One steam engine, 100 cars, 39 of which are diesel, or two diesel-driven 50-seater coaches. Now, it's always going to be quicker to drive from Barnsport to Linton and Linmouth instead of take a train which maxes out at 25 miles an hour, but one thing the railway can offer up is an ease in leisurely road congestion, the sort which isn't an essential commute to work, but just a convenient country exploration. One of the complaints is that the railway is going to take people from one car park to another car park. Again, isn't that a cleaner way than driving across Exmoor from one car park to another car park? The Swanage Railway brought more than 217,000 passengers into town in 2016. Surely that's a cleaner alternative than bringing 217,000 cars into the middle of Swanage. The North Yorkshire Moors Railway has been running regular steam hauled services over the national network into Whitby for more than 10 years now. With an average of nearly 300,000 passengers a year, it's interesting to note that there's now 15% less road traffic in Whitby than there was in the year 2000. Another thing to bear in mind is the Exmoor National Park has been facing a steady fall in tourism to the area over the last few years, and according to the Exmoor National Park Visitor Survey of 2016, its biggest major failing was in public transport, with 40% of visitors saying it was good, but 43% saying it was only fair, and 18% saying it was poor. Now, a heritage railway which doesn't run 24-7 is unlikely to be a bustling commuter line, but as demonstrated with Swanage and other areas, a heritage line brings benefits that the local economy becomes all too reliant on. When the Severn Valley Railway was closed north of Bewdley in 2007 due to mass flood damage, local businesses in Bridge North felt the pinch and some were even forced to close down. When the Fairbourne Steam Railway was facing closure in 2011 due to the loss of its biggest benefactor, there were fears that the retailers next to Fairbourne Station would also suffer. The Welsh Highland Railway was heavily opposed by local farmers during its reopening between 1997 and 2010, and now both it and the Festiniog regularly bring more than £25 million a year to the local economy, creating more than 100 jobs during the peak season. As for the Linton and Barnstable, they may have been running just a mile of track out of Woody Bay since 2004, but they have carried more than half a million passengers in 13 years. They've effectively brought an average of around 38,461 people a year to the area, people who otherwise may not have visited that part of North Devon. I know I'm likely to seem biased towards the reopening of a railway, seeing as I've been a die-hard rail fan my whole life, but here's the thing. If anybody is opposed to a railway being laid across their land because it's been virgin territory since the dawn of time and could potentially change the landscape beyond recognition, then it's understandable, and it's certainly no excuse for rail fans to defend such a cause by stooping to lower levels. But, if there's opposition to the rectification of a closed line because there's concerns of the environmental impact, it's unlikely that any environmental defence will be helped by dismissing a serious railway proposal as toy choo-choo trains. Do locals want people to explore Exmoor? It's unlikely that all tourists will be encouraged to see it by forcing them to walk all the way across it. After all, it's not the age of Lorna Doone anymore. So instead, perhaps it could be beneficial for the objectionists to take some time to study the economies of areas surrounding towns including, but not limited to, Aberystwyth, Alsford and Alton, Bodmin, Bridge North, Bury, Carnarvon, Didcot, Fairbourne, Lanberis, Minehead, Porthmadog, Ravenglass, Swanage, Tenterden, Tawen, and Whitby, and think about which tourist attraction is causing them less overall harm and more overall prosperity. As for the rest of us, it looks like the LMB's got a clear road ahead for the next phase of its reopening. Shall we get behind rebuilding it? I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue.